I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design. In this episode of the show, you're going to hear from Charles Pavarini III. <laughs> Pavarini has reinterpreted the legacy of the Pavarini Construction Company, known for creating historic landmarks, including the Seagram Tower, the United Nations, the State Theater at Lincoln Center, and and numerous other landmark buildings in New York City and throughout the world. All of his projects hinge around a, a powerful central design theme and maintain a certain vision, which is always dramatically executed, given Charles' keen sense of color, style, and use of lighting as a design tool. Having sat on the board of directors of the Designers Lighting Forum of New York for 25 years, he's refined this approach to interior design, always staged with strong focal points and extracting and exacting lighting techniques to harness the artistic and architectural vernacular of the space he designs. His extensive experience in the performing arts as performer, costume designer, and set designer qualify him to conceive projects of any scale and proportion, really, with great dignity and an unmatched passion for mood. While that's in the bio, it should also be noted that Pavarini co-authored a book that was featured recently on a book look, his offering, Lighting Beyond Edison, brilliant residential lighting techniques in the age of LEDs is truly a transformative look at what's possible in modern lighting and how it works to elevate the design and increase functionality. We're going to cover this and so much more right after this. I am incredibly proud of Convo by Design in year 10, and I'm equally proud of my partnership with Thermosol. They've been presenting partners of Convo by Design for three years now, and there is a certain amount of pride that comes with saying that the show is presented by the company that is the best in the world at what they do. Thermosol engineers the most exceptional smart shower products and steam shower systems worldwide for a few reasons. They were the first company to design patent the technology here in the U.S. dating back to 1958. Thermosol, a U.S. brand, a U.S. manufacturer in Round Rock, Texas, employs an engineering team that designs, tests, and continuously refines the product. Their quality control team tests every single steam generator before it departs the factory. Who else does that? Nobody. I have had the pleasure of working with some world-class designers and architects who tell me And you probably know this, that the idea of luxury has changed and continues to change, especially when clients want a spa-like bathroom. Steam is mandatory. Or it's just not considered a a, a luxury space. And if you want to add steam, you have one true option. It's Thermosol. And now, Thermosol, the industry leader in steam, bath equipment, and technology since 1958, is enhancing their already stellar family of products with new indoor and outdoor luxury saunas. Available in three design configurations, each sauna is handcrafted from clear western red cedar or Nordic spruce, inspired by the brilliance of northern European sauna technology and design. A luxury bathroom isn't luxury without steam. If you want luxury, you have one option. It's Thermosol. Check them out at thermosol.com and at thermosol on the socials. Charles, I, I so appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to join me today. That I am a sucker, and I say this all the time, but I am a sucker for an origin story. But when you combine the origin story with provenance and family history, it, will you do me a favor, back up, tell me the story, tell me about the up, your upbringing it, and, and tell me what about the industry made you want to follow familial footsteps um, and how you wound up here? Good questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, when I was five years old, my father was completing, my father, grandfather, my uncle, they were completing the Seagram building on Park Avenue. And I'm Charles III and my grandfather, my father. They took me up to flag the building. And there were no walls. We were on top of the building, you know, installing a flag on top. I had not a clue what they were doing. I was just grabbing my father's leg because I was very thin and I thought I'd fly off the building. Um, And that really started my, my perception of architecture and design and creativity. 
Um, but from there, my father moved us out to Arizona. And that's how I got to Arizona um, when I was six or so. And from, from there, my father was, um, he moved us out there to build attached homes. And in 1960, that was kind of unheard of in Arizona, which was all desert. And my, my grandfather thought he had flipped out to take a buyout from um, building iconic skyscrapers to go build attached homes in Arizona. Um, unfortunately, he never saw his vision or his dream. He passed away at 54 and left us out in the desert. So when I was 19, I came back to the city and I came back to pursue a theatrical career. And that's where I, I really understood the power of light is from my theatrical experience. I, I did um, many shows, Chorus Line, Cabaret, et cetera. And especially in Chorus Line, you have to find your light. If you don't find your light, um, <laughs> you're, you're in darkness. And I did, did real, realize the power of light and what light can do. And um, after a 12, 14 year career in uh, theater, I thought I'd like to eat a little bit better and maybe own something someday. So I went back to school and I went to the New York School of Interior Design for four years. I have a BFA in interior design. And from there, I started my design career. And I worked with Ruben de Saavedra. Uh, he was an international designer at the time and I spent two years right at his side and learned an enormous amount about luxury design. And that's basically what my firm does. We're luxury designers. But through the, through the years, um, lighting has always been a focus of mine um, because I feel that you can make and and install the most beautiful design. If you cannot see it properly, it's it falls short. And <clears throat> I'm not a lighting designer. I'm not a lighting consultant. I'm an interior designer who uses light as a design tool within my projects. And after many, many years and uh, many designers coming up and asking me about lighting, I thought, especially with the new LEDs, that many did not know about the LEDs, how to use them, what performance the LEDs had within an interior. So I, I thought about it and I thought, you know, I need to write a book about this because I did research books on lighting design and they were all written by lighting designers or consultants or manufacturers. And I thought it'd be really interesting for a book to be written from the perspective of an interior designer on lighting and on interior lighting. So I set forth to um, venture into writing this book, which I never thought would be so arduous. And, um, you know, somehow when you're beginning a project like that, you, you kind of think, well, it's just going to appear. <laughs> well, it did not. Um, it went through many reiterations of the book and... We wanted to write the book so that interior designers and home homeowners and clients could understand about LEDs. So it is lightly technical enough that the interior designer can talk to an electrician or a contractor about light. And the best way of any any uh, principle is to learn the aspects of it and also to learn the language 
so that you can communicate that. So I started off with the book and and I thought, how am I going to write this book so that it's understandable to an interior designer? Because I know that interior designers, once you start your career, rarely do you go back to school and rarely do you pick up you know, information that is as critical and intense as lighting. So I, I, after a couple of reiterations, I thought I'm going to write the book with a chapter on each room in a house. And how do you light that room? Some technical information about the light source, um, especially color, uh, intensity, brightness. And I did write uh, the book on chapters for individual rooms. And at the end of each chapter, I also have uh, tips on how to light that room and what, how many lumens that you, do you need to light the room. And some of the uh, techniques that I've used and I've learned just through doing. And I do have diagrams within the book that one can um, assess, they can follow, or from that devise their own technique and creativity on how to use LEDs. So it's so funny, you have, you've totally jumped so far ahead of me that I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit reverse (laughs) and we're going to back up. What I will tell you is we're going to come back. We're going to come back to the book in a little bit, but by the time this episode airs on the podcast, listeners will, will have already heard and I'll put a show note. I'll put a link in the show notes back to the book. Look, uh, the book review I do, because I have your book lighting beyond Edison and brilliant residential lighting techniques. Um, When I started doing, I did a social piece on it as well. And when I, when I first received the book, I was really excited. And then I got through it and it was one of those where I had a hard time putting it down. And it's not, it's not because it's one of those where like, you know how you'll be just a John Grisham, you'll just be into it. Right. And your stories and it wasn't because of that. It was because the the book that you've crafted, and again, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but the book that you've, you've crafted is part storytelling. It is. Yes. It's, yes. It's, part, it's, it's part technical manual. It's part DIY. It's part, I mean, it's, it's part textbook. There's a lot that goes into this. This is a multifunctional uh, tome on lighting and use of lighting in a, in a modern era, which is really fascinating. And I, I, maybe I don't have to, maybe I've just got, I kind of gotten to everything, but I, I want to back up a second. Talk to me about the storytelling and what you, what you gleaned from your experience, both as student, son, grandson, nephew, of highly skilled creatives in architecture and design and what you learned in the theater that kind of put those two ideas together that enabled you not not just to understand the story and the language. So architecture is a language, design is the narrative, but now you've, you've gone into theater and you understand the storytelling aspect of it, the acting it out, the playing it out, the lighting so that it can, it, it can, it can establish mood. The one thing I can compare this to is years ago, uh, I had a chance to interview um, and have a great conversation with Dakota Jackson. And we're talking about art furniture and, and we, we're talking about his background as a magician. He's very it's- interesting. Yeah. 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 But but what I found so fascinating and why I'm drawing this correlation between his experience growing up as a magician's son and a magician himself, then into this art furniture era. And then he's hired, you know, by Yoko to do a piece for John Lennon. And he created this, this 
based on his experience with magic, created this desk with a hidden compartment. And that kind of informed and informed how he viewed furniture. I see a correlation between the business, the design, the architecture, your history now with, with theatrical experience and how that affected your view of lighting. Uh, can you draw the correlation? Can you tell me how one informed and continues to inform the other? Well, I, I, that you just put out a lot on the table. <laughs> um, but, you know, any type of creative um, endeavor is really storytelling. Interiors are storytelling. So, Pulling that, you know, from theater and the experience in how do you tell a story on stage, I brought that in and I do bring that into my interiors. And, you know, from that, you, one of the aspects that you cannot negate is light. Um, we we need to see what we've created and what we're doing. Um, but I don't use light necessarily to illuminate a space. I use light to enhance a space. And lighting can do that. And you can change the feeling of a room just by lighting. And I think that's what LEDs allow us to do, is to change the room in feeling through a color, whether it's intense color or just the color of white. Um, and in daylight given to, you know, um, evening light. And I, I do feel that lighting obviously is so important because I actually wrote a book about it. Um, but, you know, um, you, you touched on um my family um at first i didn't think that what my family was doing was creative they were architects and building these skyscrapers but my vision when i was young was theater and i did not make that correlation between design and theater until much 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 later in my career um, matter of fact, I did a show house, probably the fifth show house that I uh, did years ago. And I walked into the room and I stopped cold and looked at my room. And for the first time, I understood my style, which was amazing to me that I was designing for years and really was not that in touch with my own style. Um, but again, you know, I'm going to keep on referring back to light. Um, that, that room incorporated light in a different way. And that's when I realized that one of the aspects of my personal design is is illumination and how to use that in a subtle way in a dramatic way and you know given an, a theatrical experience um theater is drama that's what that experience is about and to um make you feel different emotions and i i work to tra transcribe that experience into home interiors. What's interesting to me as well is, you know, your experiences as a performer and stylist and costume designer, your experience in the theater, right? And as an interior designer, I, because interior design is performative, it is, it is, you are, you are a performer, you're a creative performer, and you are setting up a set 
now it's really interesting to me because I have immense respect. I, I'm infatuated with uh, set decorators. I, I love what set decorators do. You can't call a set decorator an interior designer because they'll be the oh. first to tell you I'm not an interior designer. But there are a lot of correlations between what a set decorator and an interior designer do, especially when you get to the idea of a show house. And yes. I wanted to, and I want to drill down on the show house idea a little bit because to me, this is where an interior designer gets to be a set decorator. And one of the things I love about set decorators is that they, they're not designing for a client. They're designing for a character. They're designing for a script, which means you can take the written word and you can take how someone is described by the writers and you can add your own creative elements to, to what that person is, who that person is, the very essence of their being, how they act, who they interact with, what, what, what their personal picadillos are and what problems they have. And you can define a person by their environment. I think that's true. And I think that yes. that's what interior designers, that is the superpower that's, that interior designers possess, is that feeling that, that they, can, they can give their clients a place to be and be one with who they really are, because an interior designer understands how to create the environment for that person, right? So that being that's said, talk to me about how you view the difference between designing for a client and designing a show house where you really do kind of get the opportunity to create based on an idea as opposed to a particular client? Uh, that's a very interesting perspective because with a show house, you don't necessarily, as you stated, have a particular client in mind. You can create a story that helps the, the room, the show house, evolve into uh, you know, a room that is relation you can relate to. And in in interiors, the real world interiors, you do have a client. And when you use that word client, there are restrictions in taste, in finances, um, you know, all the way down the, the board in color, et cetera. Um, but in a show house, it really allows the designer freedom of their own design vision. And I've done, um, I think to date, I've done 22 show houses and I've done Kip Space six times. Um, the show houses are um, very arduous because you have four or five weeks to mount a full room. But, um, you know, the, the industry comes to support the designer in, in that. But with the show house, it's a moment where in a real live interior, that moment carries on from day to day through holidays, through family affairs, through entertainment, et cetera, where a show house is really a stagnant interpretation of a design vision. And <clears throat> I personally, when I do a show house, I, my focus is to move design forward. And I think that's what show houses, to me, really, really mean and what the capability is for the designer. Um, <clears throat> there, there are, you know, many aspects to a, a show house, but it's, it's a stagnant room. You know, even if you try to fill it with um, plants and music, et cetera it's still a moment of an experience. 
because you uh, the, those that visit show houses, you know you're in the room for a couple minutes and then you leave and maybe you'll come back to revisit it. Um, but I, I've also with show houses, I, I wanna show the most current aspect of lighting and technology because the show house is a designer's laboratory. That's where we can mix and uh, come up with different concoctions, et cetera. And I feel very, very strongly that uh, show houses are a needed source for the designer. And I feel that that's how design moves, moves forward and moves not only the design forward, but it moves those that see the room, experience the room, it moves their experience and their knowledge forward also. And I think show houses are a, a great source for designers. You are listening to my conversation with Charles Pavarini III. We'll be right back. We are living at a time of incredible growth, both technologically and creatively with respect to interior design, exterior design, and architecture. There is no question. There are companies thinking differently about the business of design and how to make products super serve those for whom they're being made. One of those companies, and one of my favorites, is Moya Living, designer and fabricators of some of the most stunningly beautiful, incredibly durable, and highly functional kitchen, bath, and outdoor kitchen cabinetry on the market today. Powder-coated steel with stunning lines, vibrant colors to fit any design style or aesthetic. A history of designing cabinetry for the scientific community. So you know it's been tested in some of the truly the most harsh conditions available. Moya O'Neill is the CEO and founder of Moya Living. She's the inspiration behind the design. Designers, their specification process is so simple. It will make your job so much easier. Check them out online through the socials at Moya Living, their website, moyaliving.com, and in the real world, their live kitchen showroom in Fountain Valley, California. The Institute of Classical Architecture and Art Southern California chapter is a forum for professionals in the industry and enthusiasts to come together share their love, and show their commitment to the timeless principles of beauty, proportion, and observation that are embodied in classicism. Their members include renowned architects, designers, landscape architects, builders, students, artists, and creatives from every walk of life. It's a wonderful organization designed to celebrate the unique regional identity of Southern California and help develop the careers of the like-minded. If you're interested in joining or would like to learn more about sponsorship and support for the ICAA Southern California chapter, please email me, convobydesign at outlook.com. You know, it's, it's funny you say that too. And, and again, this, this, there is a similarity between set design and a show house because you have concept, you have production, you have install, you have show. Then you have strike in many cases. In some cases, you know, you, you take what's not purchased or what doesn't remain because it's hardwired or, or permanently installed. Then you have, a, you have a loadout and you move on to the next project and then it lives. It's funny, I'll, t I'll tell you the story. I haven't told it in a while. Um, I started Convo by Design 10 years ago as one of, you know, off the heels of one of my greatest achievements and one of my most horribly tear-jerking failures at the same time, I was working for, um, I was consulting for California Home and Design Magazine, and I worked on a design house. And I had Warner Brothers property department doing some stuff, and I had some incredible designers. And at the end of this project, with great stories, you know, the guys who built the tumbler for Batman we're, we're building things for this design house and the paint department. It was amazing. And I was so busy doing the management of the project that I didn't record any interviews. 
I didn't do, I didn't, I didn't take any pictures. I didn't, wow. I didn't do it. I didn't do anything. <laughs> you know, there I have, I have, you know, a box of magazines still from that September of 20, whatever issues. Uh, and I have, um, you know, there's two videos that were shot by the magazine, but I realized that it's almost like producing a TV show and then forgetting to have it aired is, is, basically, <laughs> is basically how I felt about it. <laughs> but I want to kind of drive back to this because lighting is so important to you and, and it's, it's all part of the design process. Talk to me about your vision, your process. Do you write a story for, for your space? Do you give it characters? Do you, how do you define what the narrative is in advance or is it a visualization process for you? For me, it's more of a visualization process. Um, I don't write a narrative. I don't write, um, you know, a, um, <clears throat> a, form of what the room is for and and who it's for, et cetera, when doing a show house. Um, I go by visual and the way that I design is really intuitively and by inner feelings of how and what works together. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's more intuitive for me in my design process. And I feel that each selection or each focus leads you to others. And after, after a certain amount of time and process, the room will start to tell you what it needs if you're really attuned to it. <clears throat> and, you know, getting back to theater vis-a-vis -vis a show house, they are very similar because they are a moment in time. Very much like a show. When you see a stage set, that is a moment in time. And that stage set can give you all the clues that you would need for the narrative. Uh, it tells you about character. It tells you what the characters are like. And very much our homes are that way. You know, when you go into a home, you, you're really going into the personality of the client. And that really should be um, augmented. Um, so <clears throat> the stage sets and um, show houses, I find very similar. And when I'm doing a show house, that's my perspective, is I'm really doing a stage set. This room is not going to live more than four or five weeks. It's, like I said, a moment in time. And uh, what... I want to get back from it is that when people view the room, that they understand what design can do, because design is very, very powerful. It can, you know, it motivates us, it inspires productivity, um, it lifts our moods, etc. And <clears throat> very much lighting interfaces with that. Speaking of that, you know, and getting, getting back to the book a little bit, I want, I, I want your philosophy on, I want to sort of explore your philosophy rather on, on lighting because we're at this really interesting phase right now. And I kind of want to juxtapose two ideas. The first is from a theater perspective, you know, theater is really theater and theater lighting is really it's three dimensional, but in, in a in a two dimensional construct. So it's really meant for how does how does it look from the audience's perspective, front of house looking onto the stage when you get into 
show houses, you're not really living there. It's kind of a three-dimensional, 360-degree set. But when you get into a residential design, commercial design, industrial design, hospitality design, there's a you know classroom design, uh, senior living design. There are ideas that are combined between wellness and experience and a, a, a true three-dimensional experience because the view from one side of the room is one thing, but the view from the other side of the room is another. Lighting is one of those things that anyone who's ever done photography or videography or set design or anything that has to do with really focusing lighting and you will know working with light is kind of like working with water. It's very, very challenging. Yeah. And at the, and at the same time, you are focusing spe specifically with the book, you're focusing on LEDs. This, this, the way that we are rapidly moving through the lighting process where, you know, now, now we've actually got a hard date to the, to the day incandescence will no longer be sold. So legally, incandescents are not just phased out as a, as a philosophy or a recommendation, but they are going away. You're not going to yes. be able to buy incandescents anymore. CFLs were kind of like this bastard child that nobody loved, but felt like they kind of had to use it. Just, <laughs> right. well, he's our kid. We kind of got to use it. They were horrible. I, you know, CFLs, horrible. I'm not a fan of CFLs or, or any fluorescence really for that matter. But that being said, there is a place for it. And exactly. Now, yes. And now, and now you look at you look at LEDs, which have just transcended this this rise to to functionality. Uh, it's amazing what you can do with LEDs, but due to the nature of the light it, emu it, it emits, it's more of a challenge than the traditional incandescent. So juxtapose those two ideas for a second and explain sort of in in the origin of the book and writing the book how a designer how an end user how a consumer how a homeowner really uses these ideas to to make it work for them in their particular environment or project well i think that in order to use the leds um, one needs to know all of the possibilities that the LEDs allow us in design. Because incandescent, it was a it was a bulb. You know, you turn it on, you turn it off, three-way, maybe a dimmer, etc. It did not um interface with color, um rendition. Uh it it was you know, really a one, one source. With LEDs, I think that writing the book, I've, I've given the, the reader more creative space with light by knowing about light. I'm still learning it. I think we all are still learning it. LEDs, are really new. You know, the incandescent light's been around for over 100 years. Um, Edison uh, created that and came up with that source of light in 1879 or so. And now, you know, it's just the past 20 years, really, that we're embracing LEDs. And because of the um, energy consumption, which is minimal, and uh, the the um, I'm trying to say the um, less heat buildup from LEDs allows us to do things that we could never do before. Um, I use now LEDs in the back of headboards to light up in back of the headboard. And I do that against upholstered walls. Uh, if I did that with incandescent, number one, there's not a bulb that is small enough and I would catch the house on fire because of the heat. But now there's there's, there's that. <laughs> there's that. Yeah. <laughs> that minor point. Um, but with with the new technology and especially with the LED strip lighting, 
there is so much that can be done. And now, because of that new technology of lighting, the way light is installed and manufactured, we have diffusers going over the um, LED tapes to diffuse the light and to really um, guide the light into a certain um, spectrum. <clears throat> and also, you know, th there's many designers that are now embedding light into furniture, which we were really rarely to do. I mean, I've seen um, carpeting that has light in it. And I think in the next next probably decade, we're going to see such advancements in lighting. And because we see that almost on a daily basis, how it is moving so, so rapidly forward that it is hard to keep up with it. Um, when I do a lighting story in a room, um, if it is complicated, I will... Um, I will get a lighting consultant or designer to work with me. I'm very specific on what I want the light to do, but not. I don't necessarily know all of the fixtures and instruments to provide the light that I have in my mind. So that is that is a a education in and of itself is just light fixtures. But what I've done within the book is I have QR codes um, that you can go to the QR code and you can update information directly from manufacturers of light sources. And that has, I've, I've gotten a lot of comments on that because, you know, the book is the written word, it's on the page. But to get more information, instead of searching for the information, I've done QR codes because, so that you can update and, and um, get the most current information on light. And I did that because I, I didn't want the book to go out of print you know, so quickly because um, the lighting is progressing so rapidly so that you can go and get um, additional information. Follow up to that, uh, and specifically to what you're describing. I've been mentioning this a lot lately because I have become completely absorbed in artificial intelligence. I'm taking a, and I've mentioned this, so for those who are listening to the show, sorry, I know you're totally sick of, tired of me mentioning this, but um, I'm taking <laughs> I a haven't, course. I haven't heard it. <laughs> I'm I'm taking an an AI and machine learning course through MIT and it has been nothing short of eye-opening and fascinating because I feel like right now you know everyone in in the industry is so singularly focused on chat GPT because of its ability to write content that people can use for blog posts and the like and that sort of thing and articles and that's great but that is probably the the least most effective tool that AI is going to be providing the design and architecture industry. And you know, mid journey next, we're describing a uh, what a space would look like. There was recently a, a post on on social media about what Rick James, you know, pad in the in the late seventies, early eighties would look like. And it was probably, I don't know, 21, 24 images and amazing, like absolutely incredible design never happened, never existed. It was, it was completely imagined and made up, but it was exquisite. It was fantastic. And I've been toying with that too. And it's really amazing what it'll do. But that too kind of feels a little bit like a toy. When right. we talk about lighting, it gets me thinking like what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is basically the byproduct of machine learning, which is you feed data into an algorithm and those data in, in form through numbers 
what something does as a reaction. And then artificial intelligence takes the, that, those data and creates a scenario. Well, how amazing, you know, if you're doing a theater production, a major Broadway production, you know, you've got the sound guy who's got every scene set up on a mixing board where you go to scene one and it adjusts the, the, the faders to a certain thing to turn on some mics, turn off others. You also have a lighting engineer who by scene will turn, turn up certain lights, down certain lights, spot operator has, you know, certain instructions. Well, what if, what if you had that same scenario through an app that somebody has, has on their phone or through their, you know, Apple watch or something else where when they walk into a space, it recognizes their presence and it activates the app. And so you can walk through a home where lighting scenes follow you, or you can do a lighting scene in a, in a bedroom. You could do this now where you're setting, whereas, you know, instead of individual timers, now it's an algorithm that follows you and says, okay, well, when this person walks, when this person, meaning me, as opposed to my wife or my kids, walks into this room, be it the living room or a dining room, at five o'clock, it's afternoon. At 7.30, it's dinner. So there's a completely different vibe yes. that's set for this. When, when you start thinking about the, the potential for something like this, that's gotta be, it's gotta be exciting for you, especially with the theater background where you understand what a lighting engineer does and how each set is, is specified by what emotion and what idea it's designed to explore. How does that affect the way you think about lighting in the future? Well, what you just described about walking into a room and the lighting um, levels and intensity altering towards that one individual, that's already here. You can already do that. And <clears throat> lighting, you walk into a room and it will adjust levels, etc. cetera. Um, there is a company that has, am I allowed to um, sure. mention a company? Yeah, Ket sure. Ketra through Lutron. Uh, Ketra Lighting, I used that in a show house because it was very new. And I did a wellness retreat um, as the concept of a show house. Uh, this was in 2018, and the, the word wellness has gone everywhere. And in that, the, I use Ketra Lighting because that lighting, you can program that lighting to adjust the light within your home to give you the exact location of the sun at any given time of the day. So as the sun is going across the sky, your interior lighting is adjusting also to that. And I think that that does reinforce a sense of wellness um, because you know we're all attuned to natural light and uh, the natural day from morning to evening. And um, Ketra did that. And I also used um, Ketra lighting for um, healing. And uh, there are many, many um, books, et cetera, on healing uh, light and color. And I recently did the Ronald McDonald House. I've done two of them here in, in the um, New York area. And <clears throat> again, I wanted the lighting to reinforce the purpose of the room. And the purpose of the room is for healing young children. And I, I wired this one room up. I mean, the wiring was so intense, but we had a pad on the wall and you could, the parent could come in and they could, um, add that they're feeling pain, whether it's emotional or physical. 
and red is known to alleviate pain. So when they do that, the whole room would turn red. They could sleep in the color, they could just rest in the color, et cetera. I also used, and that we call chromotherapy. And I also used a chromotherapy bathtub so that the parent could actually immerse the child in colored water so that they can get the healing from color. And color, like light, affects all of us. You know, when we um, are, are um, when we're liking a certain color, we feel better when that color is around us or on us, or we see that color. You know, our emotions completely change. <clears throat> so, you know, with light and, and color, I, I feel that they are basically very, very similar because you can't have color without light and you can't have light without color. They kind of blend into each other and through proper um, identification of light, you can change the color of a surface by the color of the light. You know, for, and I always bring this up when I'm talking about light, is if you have an orange sofa and the light is not crisp, and true, that orange sofa will start to look brown. It could go um, more red, et cetera, by the color of light that you're emitting on it. So, you know, light is a, such an important aspect of interiors as it is in this, in this stage, as it is in a show house, um, because with that light, we can change our perception of what we're looking at. Yeah, and it's really interesting, too, because and one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to you is because it is it is so important. And I think, you know, to designers, lighting really is an integral part of of the design to consumers. It's something that is usually the last thing they think of it's like well i'll put a lamp over there or i can put a you know i can put a another lighting source here right. because it's too dark in that corner but what many don't really take into consideration is that the lighting really is everything because it affects the paint the paint color you chose you chose based on marketing materials that explore that color in perfect lighting right uh, the sofa, the sofa you, the sofa you chose or specified that material was was created, you know, in a in a perfect lighting environment to showcase that. If you buy a a rose roche bobois mahjong sectional sofa, that that sofa is so detailed and and if you put it in bad lighting, you're not getting the best out of it. Same with any any Very material. True. Same with any material. And what I've also noticed too is that there is no such thing as a perfect lighting plan because everything is unique and individual to the people who are inhabiting it and the, the space where it resides. But back to the book, and I highly recommend it. And like I said, I, I did a, a book look section on a uh, review on it, loved it. And I think you know there's there's a link in the show notes so that everybody can go check it out. And it, get it because with the QR codes and the way that this is written, it really is a, a, a an almost completely evergreen document. Um, was And that was the idea, right? Um, yes, very much so. I wanted to create a handbook for homeowners, interior designers, et cetera. And, you know, again, I divided it up according to rooms so that you did not need to read the book from the beginning to the end. You can go, if you're doing a um, laundry room, you could go to the chapter on laundry rooms or exterior lighting. I even have a chapter on lampshades um, really um, stating what shielding light can do 
and does and how to shield light. Um, so it, I, th I think it's really inclusive of, of everything a homeowner or designer really, really needs. And I just wanted to make a comment on um, what you said last is that that's one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I noticed that a lot of interior designers, whether they're doing a home, restaurant, whatever it is, um, that the lighting is the last thing they think about. Okay, I've designed the room. Now I need to, like you said, I need to put a lamp over there because it's kind of dark over there. Um, but they're not using lighting to the best of the ability of the light. We can manipulate um, how we perceive a space by how we light the space. Not necessarily design the space, that's part of it, but how we perceive the space really has almost everything to do with light. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, again, I, I highly recommend uh, the book. I think you did a great job with it. Love your work. And, and Charles, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come on the show today. I thank you so much. And I hope that uh, this book will help um, the reader um, in, in their light, um, <laughs> and lighting, um, perspectives. Love it. Design Hardware's newly remodeled showroom is where you will find a gallery style space with a thoughtful display of products purposefully positioned to allow unbridled exploration and discovery, high-end faucets, luxury tile, Natural stone, wood floors, and bespoke hardware selections are presented in a holistic manner, strategically arranged to stimulate creativity and transition your vision from the conceptual stage to a fully realized space. Conveniently located, free parking available, stop by to find your inspiration, collect samples, get expert advice, and tackle everything on your shopping list all in one place. Visit them online at designhardware.com or in the real world, 6053 West 3rd Street in Los Angeles. You hear conversations about transformative design all the time on Convo by Design. We talk about it all the time. But what does that really mean? Design improves the lives of those who inhabit the space. But it also feeds the creativity and the soul of the creative. Are you looking for a way to give back? The Oasis Alliance is a 501c3 collective of creatives based in and around the Washington, D.C. area with a mission to provide healing spaces to those who are rebuilding, rehabilitating, and recovering. Have you wondered how to apply your design skills to uplift your community? It all starts with a desire and a willingness to share your gifts. Danielle Woodhouse Johnson of the Oasis Alliance and her team are looking for guest designers, in-kind sponsors, and funding to make better the spaces and therefore the lives of everyday people who find themselves coming out of traumatic situations. Check out theoasisalliance.org for more information. Thanks for helping. Thank you, Charles, for the time. Thank you to my partners and sponsors, Thermosol, Moya Living, Design Hardware. I truly appreciate the partnership, and thank you for listening, downloading, and subscribing to the podcast. Please make sure you are subscribing so you get every episode of the show the moment it's published. Please also email me with suggestions and show ideas and guest suggestions. I, I love them, um, and I reach out to many of them. Email is convo by design at outlook.com and Instagram at convo by design with an X. Thanks for listening. Until next week, be well and take today first. Mm -hmm.